for today, we're going to be looking at your phytoplankton and your zooplankton toes from last week. And actually, so we have those for you to look at if you want to specifically look at those samples that you collected. But Ume did go out this morning and collect a live sample, which is actually really fun to look at a live sample. So we'll start with that. And then we do have your samples if you want to jump back and look at those as well. The section earlier didn't have time to look at uh, anything else besides the live sample. Um, but that's really fun because you can see the copepods swimming around. You can see dinoflagellates swimming around. So it's just really fun to look at the live samples. Um, so for your lab prep assignment, you had to look through that phytoplankton identification guide and get familiar with that. So you'll see that is next to your microscope. <clears throat> so you have a few items near your microscope. So you have the phytoplankton identification guide that's either in a binder or it's in those laminated, not laminated, but those, those plastic sheets. Um, and that's the same ID guide that you guys looked at online. You also have a zooplankton identification packet that one of the other grad students in the marine biology department was kind enough, uh, Jillian Gilmartin, was kind enough to scan some pages from that, that book um, and send them to me as like a little impromptu zooplankton guide. So it's not perfect, but it gives us some guidance uh, trying to identify some of the zooplankton. And we did see several species of copepods. Earlier we saw some barnacle larvae. Um, we also saw some, some other types of larvae that we weren't able to identify. <laughs> so as you're going through today, you also have your worksheet that says phytoplankton identification, zooplankton identification, and it has like the table kind of format. So you're gonna be sketching eight different organisms that you see today. If you, don't, if you can't find four zooplankton species, don't worry, just go ahead and find more phytoplankton. So you're pretty much just gonna be drawing eight organisms that you see today. Some, sometimes, um, depending on the drop that you get of sample, you have more zooplankton or more phytoplankton. So we'll just go with eight organisms that you see. And so what we're gonna do is, I'll go through a little PowerPoint slide of some of the common diatoms and dinoflagellates that you may see in your sample, just so you have an idea of what you're looking for. And then we're gonna go through and set up your first slide together and get you guys reacquainted with the microscopes. So you'll see that at your, um, at your station, you also have this, this um, microscope, uh, um, like how to use a compound microscope guide. <clears throat> so we'll walk through the first sample together, get your microscope all set up, but if you get confused or you can't focus, you can always refer back to this. And Ume and I will be cruising around helping you guys as well. So we won't leave you hanging. <laughs> we'll get you all set up. All right, so let me turn this on. And we'll just look at some common phytoplankton. I'll give you kind of some pointers on things to look for to help you identify some of the species that you'll be seeing. And I'll give you a spoiler alert and show you actually a sample that was analyzed uh, that was actually run here. I should have turned the projector on early. Sorry. There we go. I'm going to turn the lights off for just a little bit so you can see this. So here, you see all these little images? So this is actually a water sample that was collected from the boat basin yesterday. And it was run through an instrument called an imaging flow cytobot. And it's pretty much a, it's like a camera hooked up to a microscope. And you can take up to 10,000 images in like 20 minutes. So after going, after you go through today and try to find just eight species, I think you'll have a different kind of appreciation for this technology. <laughs> so these are some of the diatoms that you may actually be seeing in your sample. Um, and this actually, this data here is publicly available. So if you guys are interested in getting the link, you can actually look at this every day we load a sample. Uh, we have student workers that go down, or student volunteers, I should say, that go down to the boat basin, collect a sample, come up and run it through the instrument, and then they look through this looking for harmful algal bloom species specifically. And we're actually paid by Texas Parks and Wildlife to monitor for harmful algal bloom species in Galveston Bay. So we provide an early warning detection system. Um, for harmful algal blooms in the Bay Area. So, that's kind of a teaser of what you may be seeing <laughs> today. So now, let's take a look at some of the, the phytoplankton 
that you may be seeing uh, in your samples today. So pretty much, you're going to be seeing a lot of diatoms. The diatoms are the larger types of phytoplankton. Uh, they're really, I think they're really beautiful. They have large silica frustules, and they're a lot easier to see on these compound microscopes that you guys are using today. And so we're gonna go through and look at some different examples. Oh, I grabbed the wrong clicker. We're gonna go through and look at some examples of different types of phytoplankton that you may see in your sample. So again, you're primarily gonna be seeing diatoms. You may every once in a while see a little round cell cruise across your slide, and that may be a dinoflagellate. They're typically much smaller, but those are mobile. They have the flagella. Diatoms don't. Diatoms do not have flagella, so they don't actually actively move. You will see them move in the water column, but it's based on lipid production in their cells. So they can actually produce more oils in their cells to make them more buoyant. So we kind of talked a little bit about density yesterday in class. So if they produce more oils in their cell, it, it's less dense in the water around it, it makes them more buoyant so they can float and stay in the surface closer to the sun. Because they all have chloroplasts and they photosynthesize, all the phytoplankton do, um, just like grass or trees, how those are photosynthetic organisms, so are phytoplankton. So each of these cells, each individual cell has chloroplasts, has a nucleus, and they function independently of each other. And you have photosynthesis taking place in each of these single cells, which is pretty cool. So diatoms alone make about 50% of the oxygen in our atmosphere. This is pretty cool. So you haven't thought about phytoplankton being important to you before? Now you know. <laughs> so these are some of the common diatoms that we're gonna be seeing. So Cosinodiscus is a really nice example. You should see a lot of these in your sample. They're disc shaped. We're gonna be looking primarily using your 10X objective and you might go up to your 40X objective. On your worksheet, it asks you to put down what magnification you're looking at or what you're viewing the, the specimen through. Whatever objective you're using, you're gonna take that times 10 because the ocular that you're looking at is 10X. So you're gonna take 10 times whatever objective you're using, and that's the total magnification. So looking at these to get this kind of a view, um, this was probably viewed using the 10X objective or 100 times magnification. Um, they're pretty big. You'll see those even in the 4X, using the 4X objective, they're pretty big round discs. The Thalassia syra, um, the individual cells are a bit smaller than the Cosinodiscus, and they also form chains. So the Cosinodiscus you'll see on their own, just single cells on their own. This is looking at, these are both Cosinodiscus, but looking at it from different viewpoints. So here you have, you're looking at the side view of Cosinodiscus, and here you're looking at the top view. So they can look like totally different species, and you might just be looking at a different orientation of the cell. And that, you just have to, you get better at recognizing that with practice. Unfortunately, that's about the only way to get better at that. <laughs> uh, the Thalassia syra make chains. So there are these small discs, but then they have a little silica spine, or a little spicule, that connects the cell, so they can actually form these chains. Here we're looking at Odontella, and again, these are both odontella, but looking at different orientation, looking at different views, and they look totally different, right? So we have seen some odontella, we saw some this morning. Uh, they have these four spines coming off of each side of the cell. Rhizoselenium, you may see some of those as well, very long and slender, and it also has these little spines that protrude from the ends. All of these little brownish yellow dots that you see, those are all individual chloroplasts. So you can have multiple chloroplasts per cell. And you have photosynthesis taking place within each of those chloroplasts. Why do you think that they have these little spines? What would be a benefit? No guesses. So they actually help provide increased surface area because the diatoms don't have flagella to keep them in the surface of the water column near the sunlight. So those spines actually increase their surface area and allow them to float in the surface near the sunlight a little bit easier. And they also change the lipid concentration or oil concentration in their cells to keep them more buoyant and keep them closer to the surface as well. 
This is my personal favorite. I love Catasteris. I couldn't tell you why, I just love it. I think it's beautiful. <laughs> and each of these is a single cell. Each of these little rectangles is a single cell. And it has four of these long setae that come off of each cell. And these setae actually overlap with the setae on the cell next to it, and that creates this chain. And again, these setae, these long setae increase the surface area to help it stay buoyant in the water column. Um, here's another species, still the same genus um, of Catasteris, but it's more like spiral shaped. And so there's hundreds of species of Catasteris. We're only gonna be identifying to the genus level. Trying to get down to species level is an art in and of itself. <laughs> so we're only gonna be going to the genus level and that's what's indicated in the identification guide as well. Here you're looking at a single cell from the top down. So again, it looks very different. So you may think you found a totally different species or totally different genus, but it's actually still catastrophic. Here are some other penates. So now these are diatoms in the class Panaceae. The other ones we looked at so far were in the class Centraceae. So these are the penates. So these are more elongated, penate-shaped. And so navicula and pleurosigma are really easy to see in like your 10x, um, using your 10x objective, probably even using your 4x objective. These are really relatively long, large cells. Bacillaria is really cool. So each of these, is each of these little long rectangles is its own cell. And they actually produce this mucus layer, it's like a sticky substance layer, that allows them to, the cells to glide along each other. And so you can have this whole bunch of cells slide out along each other to make this long chain, or they can kind of come back together and form this more compact shape. But each cell is still functioning independently of the others. So super cool. Um, Nitsia, you'll see this maybe using your 40x objective. They're pretty small, uh, maybe you know 15 microns in length, so they're pretty tiny. Um, but you may see some of those, and these are all commonly found in our area. Here's a few more diatoms. So we have Thalassia nema, and these again, these rectangles. Each of these cells is functioning independently, but they can connect. Um, by sticky, sticky substances here at the end, and they can form this kind of accordion shape with this fan-shaped uh, structure, or you might have them make this kind of star-shaped structure. And again, with them linking together, it increases their surface area to help them stay more buoyant. Uh, Asteria nelliopsis, each of these little triangles is a cell, and it has one long spine coming off of it. And then they make these chains as well. And again, those spines help um, Keep it floating, right? Keep it more buoyant, increase the surface area. And with these and with catasteris, with these big spines, if you have a big bloom of these, they can actually get clogged in fish gills and cause, cause fish to die because they clog the gills of the fish and doesn't allow the oxygen to get um, absorbed into the bloodstream of the fish. So they don't produce a toxin, but they can still cause fish gills just in their sheer abundance and this is called a mechanical means of, of causing a fish kill. So kind of interesting there. Um, the like Morpho, we find that more when we have more fresh water. Uh, it has kind of this fan shape. You can see all the individual chloroplasts, multiple chloroplasts per cell. And so those are the most common di diatoms that you'll be seeing. Uh, today you might, find, you might find others, and those are all present in your identification guide. So the dinoflagellates, these, some of these, um, some of the dinoflagellates can actually produce toxins. So I mentioned that when we were looking at the first slide with all the different phytoplankton up there. Um, some of the dinoflagellates can produce toxins that can either accumulate in shellfish or finfish, and then if we as humans consume those that have been um, exposed, to that, exposed to that toxin, it can make us really sick. And if it's not treated properly, you can actually, some of these, some, some, in some cases, it can lead to death, but it's mainly due to the side effects of the toxin being present in your system. So it'll, it, it will cause like intense diarrhea, vomiting, so you actually can pass away by dehydration if you don't get treated. So um, the toxins, if you consume fish or shellfish that have been exposed to toxins, it's really bad. So that's why we help provide that service 
for Galveston Bay to monitor for harmful algal bloom species so that when we do see these species present, we can notify the health department or Texas Parks and Wildlife so they can shut down fishing in different areas of the bay um, wherever these species might be present or the toxins present. So this is showing a map of the Gulf of Mexico showing, this is just looking at this, the different um, genera that are represented in this, in this map. But the red areas indicate area uh, regions where currying of brevis is commonly found. Has anybody ever been, ex has they ever experienced red tide? Been exposed to red tide? Have you ever heard of it? No? So it's when this, this, this genus here, Carinia, uh, the species is brevis, when, they are, when they're present in really high cell counts. So you may have thousands of cells per milliliter, even more, um, and they produce a toxin called brevitoxin. And this toxin can actually become aerosolized. So if you have these Carinia in the surface producing this toxin, um, that toxin can attach to water molecules in the air and when we breathe those water molecules in with the burpee toxin on them, it's really irritating to our respiratory tracts. So our eyes get really itchy, our nose gets really itchy, your throat might get scratchy, it might feel like you have really bad allergies. And so if you have asthma, this could affect you a little bit more severely than if you don't. So depending on your health conditions, you may be affected differently. Um, but we do have, oh, we do have Carinia brevis present in our water sometimes in um, late summer months. We also sometimes have Dinophysis. This is Dinophysis ovum that also produces a toxin. And so these are the two that we're mainly looking for here because we know they've been present here before throughout different times of the year. So when we see these, we automatically notify the health department and get everybody kind of on high alert. They can go collect more samples, bring them to us, we run them for them and they give them an idea of the cell count of these species uh, across the bay. So we are watching. We're trying to keep everybody safe, right? Um, we're gonna jump over this. This is just looking at some little cartoon um, images of different types of dinoflagellates and it gives their arrangement of plates. So they all have these, these little fecal plates. Some of the species you can't even identify by looking at them through a microscope. You have to look at them using electron microscopy to count these plates. Um, that are underneath the kind of the organic layer. So it's really, like I said, it's an art form to identify some of these dino species. So some of the common um, dino, dinoflagellates that we'll see here, again, this is dinophysis. Uh, it's also known as the evil princess because a lot of them are toxin producers and they have this little like crown up at the top. So it's called the evil princess. <laughs> Not many of the phytoplankton have a common name, but that is one that, that has one. <laughs> This is serratium. This is again, this is a large, uh, relatively large dinoflagellate. All these dinoflagellates have two flagella that help them move forward or they spin the cell so they can move, make micro movements in the water column. Uh, I mentioned that the Asteria neliopsis and catastrophes of the long spines can get caught in fish gills. You can also have that occur if you have blooms of serratium. With these long horns, they can actually um, get trapped in fish gills if you have a bloom of these of these species. Peridinium, this is a little bit smaller, so this scale bar is 20 microns, so it's about maybe 80 microns across, um, but you might see this swimming across your slide. If you see like a little green ball that's cruising across your slide, it might be peridinium. Uh, we won't be able to identify it for sure using these microscopes, but it might be. It might be peridinium. Acacia sanguina, um, so this is a dinoflagellate that we do have present here in Galveston Bay. Um, and I did see this on our sample, one of our samples from a few days ago. So we may or may not see this. And again, it's pretty big. I don't have a scale bar on here, but um, if you're looking at this with the 4S, 4X objective or 10X objective, you would definitely see it. It's going to take up a pretty good percentage of your field of view using either of those objectives. Noctiluca, so this is the last one we're gonna look at up here and then we'll get to your slides. Um, so Noctiluca is actually called mixotrophic. So it, is, it does not have its own chloroplasts, but it can steal chloroplasts from other phytoplankton. So it can eat other phytoplankton cells, digest all the tissues from those cells, but keep the chloroplast, and those chloroplasts still function, still photosynthesize when it's inside the Noctiluca. 
So they're called kleptoplasts. So they're actually mixotrophic because they do ingest other organisms for food, but they also can produce their own sugars by photosynthesis. So they, they're autotrophs and heterotrophs. Pretty cool. Another fun fact about Noctiluca, they're, they're huge in terms of phytoplankton world. <laughs> um, you, this could take up your whole field of view if you're looking with a 10x objective. It could take up your whole field of view. Uh, this is an example, they're about 500 microns across. If you're looking at a water sample with a lot of Noctiluca, you might see the little specks. So you can actually see the little cells. You can't see detail, but you can actually see the, the cells. They're so large, relatively speaking, in the plankton community. Another fun fact is that they bioluminesce. So this is a chemical reaction that takes place inside the cell, and a byproduct of this reaction emits light. So when you have blooms of Noctiluca, it actually makes the waves glow this blue, beautiful blue color. And we do have blooms of Noctiluca here along Galveston. Um, I've seen it on the West End, I've seen it over in Bolivar. Usually in the spring, um, it's usually foggy out, so it's like there's cool air, but the water's starting to warm up. So they, those conditions in the water make them happy. Um, and so they can cause blooms there. So if I ever see bioluminescence, I will be sure, or hear that it's present, I will be sure to let you know. Has anybody seen bioluminescence before? Uh, there's some bays down in um, Puerto Rico as well, bioluminescent bay that's just outstanding. So if you get the opportunity to check that out, I highly recommend it. Okay. So with that, um, we will set up your sample. So you'll, you have a slide at your workstation. You have a slide, a cover slip, and your Kim wipes. And when you're setting this up, i get some props here. What you're going to do is you'll come over here, grab your pipette, and all you really need is one or two drops. So you'll put that right on your slide. And then you'll take your cover slip. Sorry, I have my back to you, Nicholas. <laughs> so you have your cover slip. Make sure you drop it at an angle. And that should push some of the air bubbles out. Because it can get confusing if you have a lot of air bubbles in here. And looking through the microscope, you may think they're plankton. They look really cool, but they're just air bubbles. So make sure you drop it at an angle. And then you're ready to put your slide on your microscope. So why doesn't everybody go ahead and do that? And then we'll get your microscope set up. And I'll use this one as an example.